Hello, Health 230 students. This is lecture two of two for chapter number 17. We will pick up where we left off and start talking about nutrition diagnosis. There are three main categories of nutrition diagnosis, intake, clinical, and behavioral slash environmental. And intake, those, those are very straightforward. More often than not, uh, when a person is clinically obese or morbidly obese, they have an intake issue and it, they're just they're, they are ingesting too many calories in comparison to the amount of calories that they're burning off yes every now and then we do see inadequate intake issues but those are going to be fairly obvious with um, with anorexia and clinical uh, clinical nutrition diagnoses those are ones that have to do with medical or physical conditions basically because someone's sick uh, they're not able to to either eat uh, an adequate diet or their body is not processing food appropriately and that usually has to do with absorption. <clears throat> Lastly, behavioral slash environmental. And we see this being an issue on a very regular basis. Uh, patients don't have the knowledge or if they do have the knowledge, their attitudes and their beliefs are such that they are not willing to make a change in their life. We live in a society where diabetes is a major issue and oftentimes these people who have diabetes type 2 they know full well what they should not be eating but because of socialization they choose to, to drink their sodas and eat their candy bars and just in general eat foods that are high in simple carbohydrates. And. Um, we also have a tendency to see that with people in the cardiac rehab cardiac rehab population. People who know full well that they should not be eating a steak or a burger or spam, but that's what they've always done and they continue to do it. Right here you see some examples of, of nutrition diagnoses. Continuing with nutrition interventions, uh, ideally we want to, to target the cause, to make a determination as to what is the root cause of the dietary issue and, and um, oftentimes that is, is very hard to, um, to change because as I said a moment ago, people oftentimes have very deep rooted beliefs as it, relate, as it relates to the foods that they eat and they think well since my mother and father and my grandmother and grandfather ate it and um, you know, and they told me it was healthy and it was fine well that's what I should be eating and you, you see that a lot with bacon and eggs people who have this mentality that you know, that's what they should be eating that, that, that's part of a healthy diet and, and certainly uh, eggs I'm not gonna say bacon but um, eggs can be part of a healthy diet when eaten in moderation but most people Many people certainly don't know how to eat in moderation. Goals of nutrition intervention, they should be measurable and oftentimes the registered dietitian is the one that will be determining what that measurable outcome is. And now we're going to switch gears we're going to talk about the information that we capture from patients. And one of the very first things that patients will do, regardless of what type of clinical setting they're going into, is they will fill out a health history questionnaire. And uh, you know, e even if a if a family physician or um, what's also called a, a primary care physician has a pretty good health history on a person, if they go to see a specialist, in particular a dietitian, uh, that that person is going to recapture that information in a health history document and um, you want to c capture information about any medications they're taking, any supplements that they're taking because supplements can negatively interact with, um, with medication. Um, uh, supplements can affect absorption, can affect metabolism. We want to look at personal and social histories in particular right there. You, you want to identify if a person has an alcohol or drug issue and uh, food and nutrition history that we'll talk about in more detail here in just a moment. Uh, here are some examples of, of historical information um, that, that's used in health history, or there, I should say is captured, historical information that is captured from a patient. And in table 17-7 you'll see medical problems. 
that are often associated with malnutrition and I will take a moment to talk about the second bullet point because it is one that you'll see with some level of regularity. Uh, alcoholics are oftentimes of a normal weight but they are they're getting so many of their calories from alcohol that uh, they, they can maintain a healthy weight but as you can well imagine alcoholic beverages are very poor in vitamins and minerals and the amino acids that our body needs so these people often oftentimes suffer from pretty severe malnutrition even though their body is of a normal or slightly above normal weight something else that's oftentimes captured is food intake data uh, there's a handful of different ways that food intake data can be captured a 24-hour recall a food record fruit food frequency questionnaire or through direct observation and in in my opinion or at least in my experiences the food frequency questionnaire is the most common and you'll see a description of each of the methods here the 24-hour recall the food frequency questionnaire the food record the direct observation make sure you look through that I did want to show you what a food frequency questionnaire looks like and uh, you'll, you'll see it in front of you there uh, take a moment and, and look through that it's very simplistic uh, how to fill this out and you'll even see that it, over on the right hand side that the food serving size is is fairly non-specific and um, that, that even though it's not necessarily extremely specific it does allow for us to capture some very good information about what a person is eating and how often they are eating it I'm, I'm not going to talk much about anthropometric measurements considering what most of you all uh, are aspiring to do in the classes that you've already taken you, you know how to take height and weight and um, yeah, that, that's all these slides are going over that yes in a clinical setting we do capture height weight um, we, we take circumferences and that by comparing those circumferences to percentile scales it gives us a pretty good indication of of a person's general health in particular when you're looking at children um, you know we, we, we look at height and we look at weight and if a child is is either low or high uh, as it relates to their percentile that gives us some very good information about their dietary intake and it is exceedingly more common that we're seeing people well above that 50th percentile because we as a population continue to grow and grow and grow and those 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 percentiles only get um, get updated periodically uh, here in in yellow or highlighted you'll see that weight gain may not be related to fat gain uh, there are clinical conditions that will result in weight gain that are not necessarily related to uh, body mass increases um, and I mean maybe I should say body fat increases uh, when a person is going through through heart failure or liver cirrhosis kidney failure it's very common for them to to have fluid retention so their weights going up but only because they are retaining more fluid not necessarily because they're they are gaining body fat Uh, so, sometimes, and, and I shouldn't say sometimes, uh, oftentimes a person, or oftentimes a doctor will look at uh, where a person's body weight is now versus where it was six months ago or a year ago. And that's the second bullet point that you see there where it says percent of usual body weight. And a, a doctor or clinician may very well want to know uh, what percent increase or what percent decrease. Uh, occurred in a person's body weight and uh, actually let me, let me let me go back just a little bit because there is a a bit of a pitfall as it relates to percent of ideal body weight the calculation is very easy and it's outlined there but the inherent problem with determining ideal body weight is that you have to you have to make a determination as to um, what a person's ideal weight is <laughs> and um, 
there, there's so many different resources out there that give you ideal body weight, it can make determining percent of ideal body weight tough. So um, just and then just know know what that is, but I seriously doubt you're going to use that in a clinical setting. Table 17-9, uh, you'll see use of of body weight for assessing nutritional risk, and we know that. Um, when a person gets down below 70% of their ideal body weight, or you see a greater than 75% drop in their usual body weight, that that person is at risk for severe malnutrition. And you don't even you don't even have to do the calculations. You can look at a person and see that they're um, they're malnourished. Now let's uh, let's talk a little bit more specifically about biochemical analysis, and these are lab tests that are performed on people and uh, they're, they're going to give us very specific information about the quantities of certain vitamins and minerals and electrolytes that are in a person's body and that gives us, gives us some clues about what conditions that person may be suffering from or how a person may very well be able to change the way that they're living uh, to, um, to improve their general health or to reduce their risk of a certain disease. And, I, and I'm going to use a very simplistic example. If a person has cardiovascular disease, well, a doctor is going to want to do a full lipid profile uh, and determine what that person's cholesterol levels are. And um, we, if a person by chance has really high low density lipoprotein and really low levels of high density lipoprotein and another way of saying that is a person has really good uh, I'm sorry really poor levels of good cholesterol and really high levels of bad cholesterol we know that person is at risk for some type of cardiac event. Right here you can see some of the routine laboratory tests the first ones there relate to anemia um, red blood cell count, hemoglobin, and hematocrit are all tests that are done to make a determination as to whether a person is anemic. Um, sometimes doctors and dietitians will look at, at MCV or mean corpuscular volume. It's also related to, uh, to anemia, but it's usually that, that test is oftentimes done later because that's going to give us some really specific information as to whether a person is suffering from microcytic or macrocytic anemia. And white blood cell count, that one's pretty straightforward. We want to know if somebody's immune system is suppressed. Uh, albumin is oftentimes looked at. And um, if a person is not getting an, an adequate amount of protein in his or her diet, then albumin is going to be, their albumin levels are going to be low. Uh, because albumin, it's a circulating protein. It's actually the, mo the most common circulating protein in the body. So look down through there, uh, at least be familiar with all of those. Uh, a couple that are, are very important, potassium and sodium. We want to know what uh, what circulating levels are. Sodium, well, people's sodium levels are usually just fine. However, potassium levels oftentimes do drop, and that's especially true in diabetics. All right, and we will we'll finish here. And um, the physical examination oftentimes gives gives us some pretty good information actually gives us very good information about whether a person is suffering from malnutrition individual cells they need nutrients to be built and of course our body is going through cell division on a very regular basis think, think back to one of my first lectures where I compared the body to a construction site and that construction site needs building blocks. Well, individual cells do as well. So if a person heals slowly or their skin or their hair um, or their, uh, the lining of their mouth, if the, those tissues are not healthy, it's a pretty good indication that the person is suffering from malnutrition. Thank you for your attention.